Hi everybody, Michael Davis here. Welcome to Bone to Pick, and we have an extraordinary treat today. We are coming to you from Tromsø, Norway, and the Arctic Trombone Festival. For those of you who aren't familiar with Tromsø, yes, it is in the Arctic Circle. It's an amazing place, and we're thrilled to be here. This is the first time we've done one of our Bone to Pick interviews where we've had a live audience, so we can't see them, but there's a wonderful smiling faces that are joining us here today. Um, but most of all, we're in for a super big treat. We have one of the most internationally renowned trombone soloist with us today, Mr. Jurgen von Rijn from Amsterdam. Uh, I've known him for many years and I've uh, been, been a fan of his for many years. Uh, he is the principal trombone of the Royal Concertgebouw Orchestra in Amsterdam. He's held that position since 1997. Uh, he, he's truly an ambassador for the trombone. He's developed new repertoire. Uh, he's brought existing repertoire to the forefront. Uh, he's a recipient of numerous awards and prizes. Uh, he's performed uh, the world premiere of the James McMillan Trombone Concerto, an amazing piece. Uh, he's gone on to solo with uh, dozens of orchestras around the world. Uh, he's a faculty member of the Amsterdam Conservatory, also an international visiting professor at the Royal Academy of Music in London. Uh, he also has a very high profile career as a chamber musician, uh, founding member of the uh, New Trombone Collective, an amazing Dutch uh, group. Also, uh, one of my favorite groups, the World Trombone Quartet, an amazing group with Michelle Biquet, uh, Joe Alessi, Stefan Schultz, who's here, and, uh, and Jorgen. So, Jorgen, thank you so much for taking time out. I know they're getting everything they can out of you here at the festival, so we appreciate you taking a minute to, to talk with us here. It's my pleasure. Let's, um, it was so fun doing some research and learning more about Jorgen's extraordinary career, but let's talk about maybe just your early influences. I know you got started pretty young, and I know you had a, a very special connection with Michelle Bouquet pretty early on in your career. Maybe just share some of those early memories with us. Yes, uh, my, my family was in the local community wind band, so it was logical for me to start to, to play an instrument. And since I was three, four years old, when they asked me which instrument will you play, I always said trombone. I don't know why, I, I cannot remember why, but somehow it was always trombone. So one of the friends of my father who was in the local wind band, the trombone player, he gave me a, a cassette of the 21 trombones, Irby Green and 21 trombones. So that was the first influence, the first sound of trombone I ever heard, and it's still one of my favorite uh, recordings. And uh, I, I listened to that many, many times. And then uh, I was very lucky to, to go to the local music school where I was a fantastic teacher called Bas Decker. He is not a famous name, but he used to be the principal trombone of the Rotterdam Philharmonic. And as a, a hobby, he was teaching in the local music school. So I was very lucky that right away I got a great teacher. And he was uh, the, the first big influence on me. He was very enthusiastic and he just made me love the trombone even more. And then, unfortunately, when I was uh, about 14 years old, he got sick, so he had to stop teaching. And he made an appointment with the teacher in Rotterdam Conservatory, George Vigel, who afterwards has been my teacher for a long time, my main teacher. And since then, I, I went to him, and he was good friends with Michel Becquet. Mm. So I was first for a few years in the preparation class of the, in the conservatory, and then I did the real conservatory. And every year we had a master class of Michel Becquet, or our whole class, we had an exchange project, so our whole class went to Lyon, or his class came to Rotterdam. So we, we met several times, and I got to know him, and I started to go to a master classes of him, and at some point I did an exchange project where I went three months to Lyon to study with him. So he was one of my heroes in playing, but also as a teacher. Yeah, sure. And, uh, yeah, I, I was actually planning to go uh, a little longer to study with him, but then I got a job in orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> you don't say no to a job in no. the Rotterdam Philharmonic, so yeah, I went back to... Uh, so that, those were a bit my, uh, my main... My main teacher always was George Vigo, uh -huh. and he was a very smart man. He, was, he, he knew exactly what, what was important for him, but he also knew how to invite the right people around him and not being stubborn and say, you have to stick with me only. You know, he yeah. always sent me to everybody. That's cool. And then, of course, I listened to all the recordings of Christian Lindbergh and Joe Alessi, and mm -hmm. they were also really big, big heroes of me. So, mm -hmm. so your first job uh, was with Rotterdam Philharmonic. You yeah. were there for a pretty short amount of time before you joined Six it. months. Six <laughs> months. <okay. laughs> 
Are so you... that's a great orchestra, and I could have stayed there for the rest of my life. Uh -huh. I, I studied in Rotterdam, and my teacher, it was the job of my teacher, so it was really a huge thing for me to get that position. Just then, a little bit unexpected, the, the principal position in the Prosecco came free. Mm. And that's always, the, in Holland, is the, the main orchestra, although Rotterdam is great as well. So I thought, if ever in my life I want to be there, I should try now. Mm -hmm. So I just went for it and got the job. So it's not that I left after six months because I didn't like it. <laughs> it's just how things went. You had a very high success rate on auditions, two for two. That yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you were a baseball player in the United States, you could make a lot of money. Statistics do well. Well, let's talk about, uh, you, of course, we'll keep coming back to the Concertabau, but I know that you debuted uh, as a soloist with the Concertabau playing the, the Tomasi Concerto in, I think it was 2001. Yeah. Did you, uh, you kind of have a feeling that this is the direction you wanted to go? You've obviously built this amazing solo career, but were you thinking about that at that point? or was Not so consciously, to be honest. I, I just love to do it. Mm. And I always like to play solo recitals and solo pieces and... Since I was quite young, I got questions to play with orchestras. When I was still in high school, I played once with the Rotterdam Philharmonic, Gröndal, and that, so that it always was there. Mm -hmm. And then when I was, of course, when you enter a big orchestra like that, first few years, you just focus on your job and make sure you keep the job. <laughs> <laughs> but after a while, I started looking around to see, and, and looking for, for things to, to develop. So I did a few international competitions and after I won some of them, the orchestra said in, in Amsterdam, like, okay, if you win audition, oh, competitions, maybe you should be a soloist with the orchestra. Mm -hmm. What would you like to play? And then I said, well, the Thomas Eve is one of the main concertos. I would love to, first time I play, I would like to play Thomas Eve. So that's how it happened. But there was not a, like a master plan behind it or something. Okay. I just yeah. like to do what I, like, what I do. Yeah. Well, you've certainly, uh, I mean, not only being a, a virtuoso soloist, but you've given so much to the instrument and to the, you know, the, the style of being a soloist. And it's hard to be a trombone soloist. We all know that uh, orchestras are generally not looking for more trombone soloists to program. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but that said, I mean, uh, as time has gone on through your career and you've built this amazing uh, uh, career and, and body of work, um, how have you approached that side of it? And are you, is it it's some, it's just something that's difficult to juggle in terms of keeping your work at the Concertabau and then also doing that? Or how have you kind of balanced those two things? Somehow, strange enough, uh, for me, it's necessary to do it. it mm. I really need it just because in the orchestra we don't have a lot of actual playing time. Mm -hmm. So, but if you have to play suddenly bolero or even sometimes just one little chorale, three soft notes, you have to be in the right shape to do it. And it can, yeah, if you're not in the right shape, it can be very hard, even the most simple thing. So, if you're a violin player and you have a three hour orchestra rehearsal, you probably play two and a half hours. But we probably t play 10 minutes maximum. Mm -hmm. So, you don't get in shape from playing in the orchestra, even somehow the opposite. You always take a cold instrument, play something very loud, <laughs> but like a punch in the face, <laughs> each time you do it. So I always felt the need to, to find other things besides the orchestra to, to really practice for and to, to really do very difficult things on a stage in front of people. So if something difficult comes by in the orchestra, I'm still able to do it. Hmm. And uh, so for me, it's always been very natural to combine. And I'm, I'm lucky to have a, a kind of job in, in Amsterdam, we have two principal trombones and we divide the programs. So which means that basically half of the time I, I, have, I, I get this time to, to practice and to prepare my other programs, but also I can prepare other things and do other things. So um, I've always had the opportunity to sort of do 50-50, playing a fantastic orchestra. And the repertoire, symphonic repertoire for trombone is some of the best notes ever written for the instrument. <laughs> to play a Mahler or a Bruckner symphony is fantastic. But I need also some challenges besides the orchestra. And then if I do a lot of other stuff, I'm very happy to come back to the orchestra and the other way around. So for me, the combination of the two is really, really what makes it mm -hmm. great. Do you feel like, I mean, you're, you're 
pretty well known as having the, the stylistic flexibility to go from modern trombone solo playing to Baroque style playing. Uh, is that something that just came naturally for you, or is that something you've been conscious of? Or, but clearly you're comfortable in pretty much anywhere they put you stylistically. Yeah, I think it's always, I love all these styles of music. I think that's where it starts, just to mm -hmm. listen to it and to enjoy it and to try to find what's, what's beautiful about it. And then when you play it yourself, you try to, to go in that direction. And the, the Baroque, I discovered a little later, because I think in trombone, in, in classical trombone, we are most of the time concentrated on the, the late romantic orchestra music and everything after. Mm -hmm. But we tend to forget that there is fantastic original trombone repertoire from Baroque, the time before the valves were invented. The trombone was the only chromatic brass instrument. So there's a lot of chamber music, with, uh, trio sonatas, I will play one of them next Saturday from Bertali. Two violins, trombone and continuo. And they're equal, equal parts. The trombone really has a solistic part. And somehow this, this, there is piles of music for that, and somehow this is forgotten. And when I went to study in Lyon with Michel Becquet, they also have a very big old music department there, and I think one of the best sekbat baroque trombone players ever or in the world is uh, Daniel Lassalle hmm. of the Sacoutier de Toulouse, and he's the teacher, baroque trombone teacher in Lyon. Okay. So through, in my time there, I suddenly discovered there is a whole world of Baroque trombone, and so yeah, that's that's opened my my eyes. So I started to study with him a little bit as well, not officially, but I just went to to Lyon several times, and then uh, yeah. So I think it all starts with with um, with really being interested in that music and uh, contemporary music. I always love to play new things. I'm always interested in in trying out stuff, and so I think. It's not a matter of uh, trying to master a specific style because you have to, but it's more like I'm interested in that music, I'm listening to it a lot, and then automatically you, you, you go with the flow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great lesson for all of us. You know, somebody at, at, at Jurgen's level, he could, he could be very, you know, this is what I do, and I'm doing it, I'm the best, you know, one of the best in the world, but he's decided to musically keep a very wide palette and be, be interested in other types of music and I think it only helps it ha if, all if I listen to moment. music uh, or when I'm traveling or whatever I listen to so many different things from hip-hop to baroque to everything so <laughs> I think it's a pity to limit yourself to a certain thing of course you, you specialize maybe in one I mean I would love to play fantastic jazz but I specialized a bit more in classical, so I leave it up to the pros. <laughs> but I mean, I, I listen to I can assure to you, you don't want to hear me play classical. <laughs> <No, but, laughs> no, it, it's nice to, to broaden your, also not only to listen to trombone. I, ma I meet many trombonists and I and ask them, students, so like, which violinist did you ever listen to? And <laughs> it's nice to, to, to listen to everything and yeah. enrich it. Your, your imagination and your, your musical uh, uh, taste. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about your work in terms of chamber music. I mean, you've touched on it just now, but uh, particularly the new Trombone Collective mm -hmm. has become like a very well-known group in the, in the trombone world. And also, of course, uh, the World Trombone Quartet uh, with, you, with Joe and Stefan and, and Michelle. But uh, maybe touch on those couple of ensembles for us. Yes, the new, tr new Trombone Collective is a group of some of my best friends, and we happened to study in Rotterdam in the same period, and we just practiced every day together, played quartets, played ensembles. Every week we had a trombone ensemble with my teacher, George Vigo, and slowly, one by one, we started to get jobs in orchestras, and at some point we felt it would be such a pity that this automatism of playing together, because we just were there all day, would disappear. Mm -hmm. So we said we should start a group and keep playing together, even if we spread out to different places. And that was the start of the New Trombon Collective. And we started to do some concerts, and at some point we thought maybe we should organize a festival, which is the still existing, called the Slide Factory. Mm -hmm. And that is now sort of the... because we're all busy, and we are all... Uh, so it's not easy for us to do many concerts in a year. But we try... we focus on, on this festival, and then 
for the festival we try to to create a new program every every time and in the meantime if we have concerts we we repeat that program until we have another one and it's just for us it's uh, it's great to be together as friends mm -hmm. and to do something and try to do something for the instrument one of the things it's the same thing for solo playing and for ensemble playing i think there is beautiful repertoire for the trombone but it's rather small the repertoire and rather limited we don't unfortunately have the big name composers that program easily mm -hmm. if we had a brahms concerto every orchestra in the world would play it but <laughs> it's difficult even though i love tomasi a programmer of, a, of an or they, they will never program it automatically and it's the same with with chamber music with with the trombone group there's no chamber music series that thinks like which trombone group will be invited next year <laughs> so there is there is this sort of emancipation so something to conquer yeah which is in a way difficult but also a very nice challenge it's nice to to work on something and to to try to create something and that's what we try with the trombone collector to ask composers to write music to to have this festival to have recordings to to make the trombone known and one of the nice things of being sort of a, a rather unknown instrument in the, is that you can surprise mm -hmm. i think with uh, it's very difficult to surprise with the possibilities of a violin or, or with the possibilities of a, of a piano you can surprise with the quality the way you play it but for violin it's already been done by paganini it's already <laughs> we already know it <laughs> and for trombone there is still a lot to conquer and a lot to surprise so if you finally get a chance to be programmed and to play in front of people people who don't know the trombone they are surprised like is that all possible with the, with the trombone so that's some kind of a nice thing and that's what we try to achieve with the trombone collective to, uh -huh. to go to new audiences to to just expand yeah. the instrument somehow great way to look at it that's a, totally the right approach and uh, and as far as the quartet goes are you guys active uh, these days or uh... all four of us are very active <laughs> <laughs> but in different parts of the world so no we are not but it's a fantastic group for me it's a huge honor like like i said michel Biquet was one of my heroes and joe was one of my heroes when i was sure. younger i i also went to new york for some lessons with joe and listened to his recordings i had an opportunity to play with him in the new york philharmonic for a while and so he's one of my one of the icons on the trombone and to have the opportunity to play with those people just in a quartet is, is a dream for me and um, the, the quartet came a little bit uh, stefan he I knew him a little bit, and he had, I think, some festivals together with Michel Biquet, and they started to speak about the quartet and who should be in there. And suddenly, I got a call: with, "Would you, would you yeah. like to play in this quartet?" So, of course, I would like to be there. And then we did a, in our festival, the Slide Factory. There was we did a concert, which was the first gathering of us. And the theme of that festival was trombones from all over the world. Mm -hmm. So Joe brought his whole class. Michel brought his class, so there were trombone players from everywhere. So sort of by the festival, it was called the World Quartet, which is now never meant in a pretentious way or anything <laughs> that we are the world trombone quartet. So, but the, the name stayed somehow. So yeah, that's. And then we started to. It was so nice that we did a few other projects. And of course, it's maybe once a year. Yeah. That we have some festival where we all can be together. The last thing was one year ago in the LSE seminar in Italy. Right. We did a concert there and we all taught. And we did a CD recording. We, we came here to Tromsø five years ago to, in, in the same week that we recorded this CD. Uh, so we, we try to find moments. And the name of this CD is, is very typical. I think it's called Just for Fun. And mm -hmm. that's really what it is. It's just very nice atmosphere everybody respects each other and it's just very very nice to play with that great people yeah well it doesn't get any better than the four of you guys and it's fun for us to listen to so i hope so we <laughs> that's what we that's what we try yeah. let's shift gears a little bit and talk about your uh, the teaching side of your career mm -hmm. um and you're on the faculty of the amsterdam conservatory and you're also doing some work at the uh, the royal academy in london yeah uh, tell us a little bit about that yeah the side. royal academy is i just go two three times a year Okay. I'm visiting professor, as they call it, but uh, that's very nice. It's, uh, it's a very, uh, 
fantastic institution, a very lot of tradition. And, uh, but my main teaching is in Amsterdam, and we have this a little bit different system as most places in the world that we do team teaching. So we have three teachers for the not from one classical, and all the students have lessons all the time with all three of us. Mm. So the other teachers are Pierre Holders and Remco de Jager. They are in the Rotterdam Philharmonic. And um, we study together. They are also in the Neutromon Collective. So they are, we are some of our, they are some of my best friends. And um, we always thought uh, there is maybe some facts about trombone playing that you have to agree about. If I would go to a student and say, slide as slow as possible, and the other teacher goes, slide as fast as possible, you get in trouble. So, so there's some, something, but other than that, nobody knows the one and only truth. Especially if it comes to music, I think it's very good if you have different influences, as long as the principles of trombone playing are the same. It's the same school, somehow. Yeah. And we are very much the same school, same background, and we know each other very well, so if there is things unclear we, we call each other and we talk about it so and that i think the nice thing about it is that i always feel a student of mine should never become a clone of me or a clone of pierre mm -hmm. if if people want pierre they will call pierre and not a clone of pierre mm -hmm. so they, they students have to find their own truth their own way so we try to 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 throw in as much of course we have a, a, a plan especially about the trombone playing and about what, what kind of pieces and, and um, what the quality we, we want to have. And then we, we rotate all the time so they get a lot of influence until the place where they almost get a bit confused and at some point say, okay, whatever they all say, this is what I want to do. <laughs> and that's exactly what we like to achieve. Uh -huh. You have to find your own path with a lot of help and information and guidance. What a great system, but that being able to have three different teachers and just get input. I mean, it's got to yeah. keep things very fresh and focused for the student. You know, that's, that's a great thing. Yeah. Um, one of the things I always have to ask, we're brass players, so we're obsessed about equipment, of course. And uh, every time I do, do an interview and don't ask about the equipment, I get, you know, piles of emails. Why didn't you ask about the equipment? I'm like, okay, okay, I'll get it. So, <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, I have to ask the obligatory question. Tell us about what you're, uh, uh, you're playing on these days, and uh, I know you've been with... The best trombone in the world. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I'm, I'm very happy. Of course, there's many good instruments nowadays, so I would never say that the one I play is the best, but I, I would say it's a very good option. I play on Courtois mm -hmm. uh, since 20 years now, and um, it's, for me, it's a very, very nice, very good trombone. It's a... Uh, red brass bell, Hartmann valve, heavy slide. Uh, and for me it's a great instrument because it has both, I can make it solid, big enough for the orchestra, it's really an orchestral instrument, but for me it also has a very elegant, nice uh, flexibility that I really like for the chamber music and the solo playing. So for me it's a very all-round instrument that uh, that works very well for me, and uh, I work together with, with them, mm -hmm. so they have made uh, some, some things for me, and probably in the near future there will be a model that will be with my signature. Yeah. yeah. And the mouthpiece is always a little funny. The mouthpiece I play is very old. Nobody actually knows what it actually, what it is. It has a million bands in it. <laughs> Everybody always starts to laugh when they <laughs> look at it. But it's a Courtois mouthpiece from, and it's uh, it's not too big. I, I always have preferred to play not too big mouthpieces. Uh, it's very personal. Sure. So yeah. I always see it as uh, the size of your feet. Mm. <laughs> if, if somebody else has big feet and has big shoes. You don't have the same size feet. It's a bit stupid to buy the same shoes, <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's the same thing for mouthpieces. For me, it always worked to to play not too big on the mouthpiece. I have rather heavy instrument with a heavy slide and the Hagman valve and the red bar. So it's a rather that's for me the right combination. And I think everybody has to find their own 
combination. For me, it's always been easier, and that's why I stick to the, to make a big sound on a rather small mouthpiece than to make a smaller, elegant sound on a big mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've tried bigger mouthpieces, and again, if you have big feet, you have big, you need big <laughs> shoes. So it it really is very personal. But for me, it it became always a bit too ooh, and I couldn't find. The, the, the center in it too much, so I always went back and I, I make, if I have to play Bruckner or Mahler or big things in the orchestra, I, tr I try to make it myself, but that's mm. very personal, so I can only say what works for me. Yeah, well, it's working <laughs> <laughs> quite well. Uh, just a couple more questions, Jürgen. Um, can you tell us what's, uh, what's on the slate for you coming up in terms of projects, in terms of things you want to accomplish, and you've done so much, but uh, I'm sure you have a uh, ideas for uh, going uh, the next couple of years. <laughs> There's always more ideas than I can <laughs> uh, do, but uh, I love this the, to, to the new repertoire, to, to ask the composer to write new pieces. So I had this Macmillan piece written for me, which is, uh, I think, a fantastic trombone concerto, could become one of the standard pieces in the mm -hmm. repertoire, I think. And uh, the next big thing for me is a recording coming out, which I'm very honored with. It's with three contemporary concertos with the Concertable Orchestra. Oh, wow. So my own colleagues, my own orchestra, which is very, very nice. It's with Macmillan, uh, Berio, which was written for Christian Lindbergh, who's one, of, uh, one other of the best pieces I think there are. And a Dutch composer called Theo Verbey, who wrote a concerto for me, which is very nice as well. And those three are on, uh, on a new CD, which comes out next week, uh, next month. And then there's two uh, big uh, com commissions coming. Um, Bryce Desner, I don't know if you know him. No, I don't. He is a rock guitarist oh, He's okay. in the rock group uh, called The National. Sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's uh, actually in the States, I think yeah, they are yeah. very big. They are big, yeah. Uh, but he is a little bit like, uh, you know, uh, Johnny Greenwood of Radiohead. Mm -hmm. He's also a classical composer. And he's the same, and he's actually becoming a very serious classical composer. He writes great music, and major orchestras in the world, they, they commission him. And he's writing a new trombone concerto for trombone, electronics, and orchestra. And Tan Dun, who is a Chinese-American composer, he lives partly in New York and partly in Shanghai. He is a, one of the most famous classical composers nowadays. He writes a trombone concerto. So that's big projects coming up. Mm. And yeah, there's other, I will play the Macmillan several times. Uh, next month I, I'm doing a very nice project. I play a piece which is written for me a few years ago with a loop station. Uh, it's called Slipstream, it's with loops. Uh, but there's a, a great video artist, Geoffrey Lillemont. He makes like stage uh, videos for Miley Cyrus and all those uh -huh. people, but he made a video and, and I do a big in a in a big stadium in Holland. There is a military tap two, but I, he made a huge video. Uh, so a very interesting, I think. It's a puppet that moves with uh, some parameters, and the, the the thing that that he he recorded my arm when I played the piece, and that's steering the puppet. <laughs> this would be on a huge wow. screen. So that's a very funny wow, that's cool. project. So there's always yeah, uh, Yeah, well, that's a full slate of uh, good stuff. We'll keep an eye out for that. I always kind of like to end our interviews this way, uh, especially when we get uh, an artist of your caliber and, and, and talents and all the things you've accomplished. But um, if there's some, we have lots of young folks out here today, uh, young folks who are looking up and saying, I want to be the next Jorgen van Rijn. You've already said, be yourself and, and go that direction. But um, let's just say somebody who wanted to build a solo career uh, playing the trombone, and there's they're young folks right now. What uh, what kind of advice you've already given us some great advice today? But in addition to that, is there any thoughts you might have for them? Yeah, I think in oh, there's a lot of, a lot to say about it. I think in the end, it's about uh, trying to do new things and the quality. Because sometimes I see people who think that in the end. Like marketing is more important, but in the end, I think practicing is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
basically, listen, like I said before, what I would always advise to people, listen to as much music as you can and try to, to look to examples, not in the trombone world, but also in other instruments. So, for me, if you, if you stick to brass, somebody like Hakan Hardenberg is, mm. is a great example. Look what, what he did. There's always great new composers writing for him, and that's made his career, uh, besides the quality mm. of the play. Um, so you can look like what, what kind of... And I, I think you can only do something you really believe in. So you can ask every composer in the world to write for you, but if they write something that, that is not your piece of cake, then you will never be able to really present it. So I think it's, it's really good to, to really investigate and research like which composer, which music relates to me, what, what would I like to do, mm -hmm. and then try to find people who can help you with that. Yeah. And other than that, it's just practice and play and... Good luck. There's not, not, there's <laughs> not a... Yeah, there's not a, a sort of a path, like a written path that you can just go and then everything will be there. Yeah, yeah. Jürgen, it's been so great to uh, spend some time with you today. Thank you for uh, taking time out of the schedule. Thank I'm looking you. forward to the next uh, three days and uh, all kinds of music making that's going on here. So. Uh, Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for uh, being our first live audience. We will see all of you next time on Bone to Pick. <laughs>